share this morning's reading. It comes from the sixth chapter of Paul's letter to the Ephesians, beginning with verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to, to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, David. Thank you for the scripture reading. And if I heard you right, I heard you say, we're just now getting to the good stuff. Is that, is that a, yeah, all right. That's pressure right there, I'll tell you. Um, whew, whew, I don't know. <laughs> but my name is Chris. Uh, I'm one of our pastors here and really glad to be able to be in worship with you today. I, can I just tell you, today has just been incredible for me. Um, so for one, it feels amazing outside, which just always is just special. Uh, there's just been such a special spirit in worship. I felt it here at 8 o'clock, at 9.30 at, in the hall, and, and again today at, at our 11 o'clock. It's, uh, ah, it's good to be in the presence of God. So thank you for investing in the way that you do that. Thank you for investing in that environment, that experience, worshiping together with our brothers and sisters who are alongside us. There's, there's nothing like it. Now let's pray, and then we'll, we'll go. God, thank you. For your word, for your scripture. Oh, it's bold, it's powerful, it's convicting, and it's hopeful. And sometimes we meet all of it at the same time, and sometimes there's only a piece. But in all times, God, we trust that as we turn to scripture, that you are revealing what you would like to speak with us today. Would you continue to do that this morning? You've done it powerfully in music, you've done it powerfully in the spoken word of, of greetings, you've done it powerfully all day today how great you are. Lord, I ask that you would please speak through me if you need to in spite of me. Make your word known. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a book I read recently called The Good Life. It's a, a book that it really, it's about a, a study that's been going on for a long time that seeks to answer this question. What makes people happy really? And you notice I said happiness instead of joy. That's a, if, I, if I said joyful, then you'd know it was a Christian book and a Christian, uh, Christian study. It's not. It's, it's, a, it's a secular study. It's a secular book. But I will tell you, when secular studies and the Christian faith come to the same conclusions, it's just worth paying attention. And this book was incredible to read and to go through and to see all the different things that drive people in their lives, their motivations, their hopes, their dreams and desires, and then what it is when, when we meet those. Uh, one of the ex exercises that this walks us through is one like this to, to get us to think about the way that we invest in our life. Uh, and, it, and it tells us to think through something like this. Imagine, imagine that when you began your life, all the money you would ever have was set aside for you in a, in a deposit. All the money you would ever have all the money you would ever need. The moment you're born, it is in a bank account, set to the side, and you are taken care of forever. So you don't have to work anymore, but everything else is still just as expensive. So whatever you do, you go into this account and you dip from it and use that to, well, to get food and water and regular housing expenses. All of those things are just as expensive as they ever were. And of course, there's also always inflation that comes with that, and it's different. Uh, but everything you do 
costs money. Not just the things that you purchase, not just the things that you would normally buy, but in this scenario, everything we do costs money. Even sending an email, something as simple as that, you have to go into your account, use whatever it takes in order to send that off, and then you send it and you go. So uh, sitting around all day in a chair doing nothing costs money. You go into your account. It's what you've decided to do. Uh, is sleeping, enjoy sleeping in, sleeping a little, whatever it is, it's an investment, and you draw out of this account, and, and you use this in order to do everything you're going to do. The catch is that you don't know how much is in your account. You have no clue. You just know you go to it all the time, and, 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 and that's what you use. The time's going to come when your account goes empty, and that's going to be the end of your life. And then the question is, if that is the way that the world worked, what would you do differently? I don't know about you, but it makes me think of the way that I'm investing in my life. Especially when you say, okay, that's not really how things work. But if we substitute the concept of money for time, that's exactly how the world works. We're all born with a massive account that we can't peek into. We don't know how much time we have, but we know that everything we do costs some of it. Sending an email, sitting around doing nothing, um, going to class, not going to class, studying really hard so we can pass, not studying at all. Whatever it is, we go to this account and we withdraw and we use this for something. And eventually the time comes when, well, that account is empty and our life is over. And when we think about that with the way that we use time, and, and think about the transactional way we always refer to time. We spend time. We pay attention. We're already in a cultural mindset that looks at our time like this. We just don't know how much we're able to spend and to pay and to do things. And when you think about it like this, it does make me think about the ways that I invest my time and what I choose to pay attention to, what I choose to fill in the time that I have. This book also points out that the strange thing about us is that half of the time uh, we use, we're always thinking or, or, or thinking of something else or occupied some other way in our minds anyway. Uh, this isn't talking about multitasking. It's talking about the mind wandering, which is just normally what we do when we're in a conversation. We'll listen to a bit, and then distractions come, and we're kind of there, but then we're also, well, we're in a conversation that we had a week ago because it was really frustrating and I didn't get to say the words that I wanted to say, and if I would have just said this, I would have won that conversation, and so we start to have those things in our mind already, and then uh, all of a sudden we realize, oh, I'm, not, I'm not quite paying attention. This is what we do. We go back into the past, and we use whatever happened into the, into the past, bring this into the present to try to predict what happens in the future. So we do this the way we navigate conversation. We go, okay, well, I I've come across a story like this that evokes emotion like this. The last time I felt these emotions was over here. It didn't work out very well for me last, so I'm going to adapt, change, do something else to show that I can say the right phrase that I'm fitting in and I'm present and I'm reciprocating what they're doing, but in reality, we're not really listening. We're not really present. We're not paying attention to the story. We just know the fact that I have a story that sounds really similar and I can pull that out of my account and, and out of my history and I can talk about this too so we can have a mutual connection thing because well, that's what matters, isn't it? Maybe in a performance-driven world, it probably matters a lot. But in an authentic relationship-driven world, I think what matters the most is pushing beyond those things and deciding to be incredibly present. I think about this. When's the last time uh, maybe you spent some time around the dinner table, conversation was going on, and you're there, and you're engaged, and you want to be present, and you want to really talk, and you're listening, and then all of a sudden something happened, and it brought this emotion up in you. And you remember a time when you felt that emotion, it made you feel a certain way, and you don't want to feel again, or you do want to feel again, you've come back to that, and now suddenly you're playing around, and this is about the time when somebody who loves you turns and says, are you even here right now? And you go, no, <laughs> I've been overwhelmed and distracted. I don't know where I am, but it's not here. Zoned out again. And 
if this is the way that we function in our regular day-to-day -day life, in our regular relationships, then it's probably worth recognizing we bring some of that into our faith relationship. We bring some of that into God. Uh, have you ever noticed why it gets so difficult sometimes to pray for a long amount of time and, and to really reflect and then all of a sudden right, some time has passed and you think about things that you have to get done and what to do and oh, there's a distraction that's come in. Or uh, the, have you ever wondered why sometimes we can sit and read the Bible and sometimes it feels amazing it comes to life and then other times you, you're reading and you go, I, I think I've turned two pages and I'm not really sure what I read while I've been going. See, here's the thing. A distracted Christian is a vulnerable Christian. And the enemy wants you distracted. Now, I'm not saying every time we have a distraction comes up that it's the work of the enemy. Sometimes that's us. And sometimes it's just what we do because of a, a short attention span or, or, or for all sorts of different reasons. Uh, but sometimes when it's one of those moments that we get pulled away from being present, then sure. I think that would be very consistent for uh, what the enemy is having us do and having us experience. Because... Well, if you're distracted in the middle of conversation, then you're not going to offer encouragement when this person needs it. And if you can just be distracted about your own frustrations, you're going to take that emotional feeling of frustration and you're going to project that upon someone else's innocent words when they didn't mean to get under your skin at all. They weren't saying what you think they said. You just heard it a certain way because you've been hurting about what you heard earlier. And now, suddenly, here's this person is now against you when they could never be more for you. That's a work of the enemy. And what I'd say is if it's us or if it's the enemy, either way, when we give in to distraction and we miss the opportunity to be engaged with what God's desire is, well, then that's a loss on our end. And that's a win for the enemy. When we give in to distractions, we struggle. But even in the middle of a distracted spirituality, faith gives us focus. Faith isn't just some sort of mental assertion of the mind, something that we say, well, I, I believe this. Faith is when we say, my, my beliefs, the things that I believe to be true, also follow up with my actions. I believe it to be true in such a way that I'd be willing to, to take a step out on that ground because I know it's going to be solid. I believe it and I can follow through with this. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says this, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. I love, I love how Tony Evans puts this. And I think I've quoted Tony Evans almost every single week in this series. But look, this is spiritual warfare. When it's that, you quote the experts, and he's incredible. He says it this way. Faith is acting like it is so, even when it is not so, so that it might be so, simply because God said so. It's good. Right? The assurance of things hoped for. And the convictions of things not seen. This is what Paul tells us, this faith, we are called to wield this like a shield. Not to hide behind, not a, not a crutch to lean on, but, but a tool to be used when the timing is right. Notice the way that the words around Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16, describe this shield of faith. It says, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. There's two things to notice about this, I think, or several, but two things that stand out to me. One is that the shield of faith isn't meant to be worn. It's meant to be taken up. It's the first piece of armor that works like this. The belt of truth, you wear it. The breastplate of righteousness, you wear it. The helmet, the shoes, all of that, you wear it at all times. Because we don't know when or when not a spiritual battle may come. And we don't want to be caught off guard. But a shield, uh, you have it with you. 
And in all circumstances when it's spiritual battle, in all circumstances when it's time to make a stand, you wield your faith to take down what the enemy brings. But you don't wear it all the time. It's different. Think about it like this. A doctor may wear scrubs all day long, a white coat, Nurse could do the same thing. Any, any sort of medical practitioner, they, they, they could wear a certain type of clothing. It's their uniform. It communicates a couple things. For one, it communicates this person's ready. This person has authority. You can trust this person. This person knows what they're doing. It also has them ready to go according to whatever patient needs may happen. It makes them more flexible and easy to move. But the stethoscope isn't picked up until it's time to use it. It might be worn around the neck for convenience, or stuffed around in a pocket for convenience. But you wouldn't put the stethoscope in your ears until it's time to listen. Now, our faith is always with us. Our faith is to be brought into every single circumstance, and especially when it's time to focus, that's where our faith comes in. Faith brings with it focus. And faith works similarly to a stethoscope to a medical professional. It's a tool to be used to accomplish something. It's a tool used to frustrate the attacks of the enemies, to give focus and clarity. Faith needs action, not just passive wearing. James tells us clearly, faith without works is dead dead. We also believe that works without faith does not accomplish what it is that Jesus desires to accomplish in people like you and me. But faith and works coming together, oh, that's a beautiful thing. This piece of armor, well, and another thing to notice here is that uh, this is the first piece of armor that has a specific purpose. The belt of truth anchors us in truth. And the shoes of the readiness of the gospel of peace, well, it helps us stand firm on peace. But the shield, Paul says, is to be used to extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And Roman soldiers would, oh man, they would face this and they knew exactly how to deal with it. There were two different types of shields that Roman soldiers would use. Often uh, there's one that's more small and round like we've got here uh, that would have been used for hand-to-hand -hand combat. But then there is these larger ones, and the Greek word that's translated to shield here is really referring to one of these larger ones. Think about four feet high, about two feet wide, large enough that you could crouch down behind it if you wanted to, and if you were alone and there was a flaming arrow coming at you, you could probably stake it in the ground, crouch down, and it would probably do okay. But if there's a large attack and a big army, well, one, why would a good soldier ever stand alone? It's not what we're called to do as Christ followers either. We're called to be together in this. On to and what the Roman soldiers' shields had to them, well, there were a lot of different layers, canvas and leather and metal around some of the most fragile spots. They could soak it in water and they could use this to extinguish any arrow that came its way. But there were also these links on the sides that would link up to other shields around them. Because that was the real strength in wielding these shields and doing so in number and doing so in the strength of someone who knows what it is to use a shield for their own protection and for yours too. And so they would link up and they would hold it together. We have a small group at our church called the Turtle Group. Yeah, well, okay, that's, there we are. All right. I forget, yeah, that's, a, hey, good, good. I, I will tell you, uh, Sue, so when I first heard of the Turtle Group, I thought, okay, so this must be the slow people. These are my people then, if that's what this is. That's not how you got your name. I love this name. So it, it's created from the formation that, that these Roman soldiers would do with their shields. And so what would happen is, is, is they, the Roman soldiers would connect each other and use these to, to shield each other. Well, this is what our turtle group does. And so when it's time to pray, when it's time to move, they have a, a saying, now tell me if I'm getting this right. It's, it's knees down, shells up. Isn't that great? Knees down, shells up. Because here's the thing, if the arrows are coming in to distract us and at a moment's notice and pull our attention away from where our focus is, I can tell you one thing, this group is not giving in to distraction. Their shields 
of faith are given for themselves, but also given for everyone else who stands with them in the middle of prayer. That's what Roman soldiers would do. These shields will not give in to the distractions of the enemy. And that's really the point of flaming arrows. Flaming arrows weren't meant to kill or destroy. They were meant to distract. They did kill sometimes or destroy sometimes. But they were given to cause more problems than the person who was receiving the attack could handle. So you're standing in the battlefield. All of a sudden, the, the fire pours in and it ignites some dry grass around you. Suddenly now there's a blaze and the army comes on and now you have to deal with the army and the fire. Or imagine this on an old western covered wagon. The canvas is lit and it's ablaze and oh my gosh, now there's such damage. We're going to lose so many different things. Now suddenly we're divided. We've got to move all everywhere else. And then this is when the enemy comes in. But when we stand with our faith connected with our brothers and sisters who stand in our faith. The enemy will try to distract. But faith cuts through the power of distraction. Faith pulls us forward. And here's the thing too, I, I could just imagine, I've never actually tried to use a shield to block anything off. I, I've used some things as shield to keep like uh, kids from running at me or something like that. That's different, right? Like pillow shields. Aha, I got you. <laughs> that's, our, that's what we're going to be doing this afternoon in our house. <laughs> I've never actually tried to thwart away anything like that. But let me tell you, I can just imagine if I was carrying one of these four feet tall shields, I soaked it in water, the first time an arrow hits that shield and it's dissolved in the smoke, I'm going to look forward to the second time and the third time, and I'm going to know how to do this. And I'll get to where I can link together with somebody else, and eventually this shield gives me confidence. Bring the fiery arrows. I've got the antidote for that. Bring whatever destruction you want. I know how to stand firm in this because I'm not alone. I stand with men and women who stand with me, and I stand on God. Why? Because Hebrews 11, chapter 1 I know what it is to have faith as the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. And the more I see my faith work well for me, uh, the more confidence I have in my faith. The more I see being able to benefit from someone else's faith, the more confidence I have of God moving in their lives. And so when you and I band together to shield one another with the power of our faith, something that just grows and grows and grows. If it's the confidence in things that are unseen, how much more confidence can we have when the unseen becomes visible? This happened in, in 2 Kings chapter 6. Elisha is getting ready for an oncoming attack. He knows it's coming because the king of Syria wants to come in and take over. Israel wants to take Elisha out because Elisha is a problem for this king of Syria. And so he sends this massive army. His servant sees, and well, in verse 15 on to 17, here's what we can read. When the servant of the man of God, that's Elisha, the man of God, when, when, so when his servant rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And Elisha said, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elijah prayed and said, O oh Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man. And he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. If faith is this confidence in things that we hope for that are unseen, when you and I have opportunities to see the impact faith makes in another, in our own lives, how much greater is that confidence when we can see the hand of God at work in every circumstance? And here is this faith that is given to us that we do not fall victim to distractions, but focus. So what do we do then with this faith? This, 
Will we believe? And that's simple and it's complicated. Will we believe? Not mentally only in our minds, but we believe in the things that God says. We, we believe in God's work. Our faith calls us to believe in God's work. In, in John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And then verse 17 gets left out often here. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So we believe in God's work. That's already accomplished. Not just a, a okay, well, someday, maybe kind of a hope. That kind of a hope doesn't do any good. That's usually the way that I, I think about hope. When I, I think about hope, I think about, uh, let me cross my fingers and get this good circumstance to happen. I, I hope my team wins. I hope there's not a safety that makes this a two-score game all of a sudden. <laughs> right? I, I hope Ryan Presley can hold off the Twins in the ninth inning because I really don't want to see the Rangers make the World Series. Um, just, just, that's a thing. I know. I know. You can judge me all you want to. Um, I just know that if, if you grumble at that, I judge you right back. I'm an Astros fan. That's all. That's all. <laughs> That's the way I think about hope. I think about, I hope something works out. I hope this movie has a good ending. I hope these commercials aren't really crazy and make me want to spend a whole bunch of money <laughs> suddenly. I hope stuff works out okay. This is the kind of hope that you and I gravitate to. But the hope that we have in Christ Jesus is not a cross your fingers, hope everything goes okay kind of a hope. It is a hope that is confidently founded in the work that God has already accomplished on our behalf. And, and see, here's the thing. This John 3.16 thing, it's the one that everybody kind of knows. We've all heard it at some point. The John 3.17, we forget it all together. We forget it because we're immediately taken. Anytime we invest in our hope, anytime we invest in our faith, the, the enemy comes back and says, yeah, but that's not about you. Ah, it doesn't work for you. Jesus is good, sure. And, and what he does in the lives of other people is incredible. But do you remember what was coming out of your mouth just 30 minutes ago? You really think the Son of God did that for you? And the answer is absolutely yes. This is God's desire and God's will that no one should perish. And the the key word here to me in John 3, 16, is that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Whoever. It's anybody. It's everyone. It's every person. Any person. And that he did this for us while we were still dead in our sin. In our rebellion, it tells you it's not about you and me. It's about Jesus. And if there's something I can believe in, it's this Jesus. Uh, maybe for some of us, we're wondering about that. But here's the invitation from God. Believe in the work that has already been accomplished. It doesn't mean you have to understand everything about it. In fact, once you say, okay, I'm, I'm in and I believe this, you're going to have all these questions and things that you don't understand and you wonder about. It, it's just the way that life works. But would you be in and would you believe in the work that's already been accomplished? And then also believe what God says about you. Ephesians chapter 2, Paul really expands on the idea of faith here. In verses 5 through 8. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. That word together and with. Not he, may, he makes us alive after Christ. Or we follow Christ into life eventually, someday. No, no, no. Your resurrection was paid for by Christ's resurrection. And you don't have to wait. This scripture says right now, already, you and I are standing in new life. And more than that, th this goes on. By grace you've been saved, and, and God raises us up with him and seats us with him in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ. 
It means that right now we're not just in this space, we're also citizens of heaven, eternally seated with Jesus, so that in the coming ages he may show his, the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. This is a gift of God. Believe what God says about you. It's not your own doing. This is God's gift. Believe that God is for you. In Romans chapter 8, 31, we see, what then shall we say about all these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And one of the biggest lies out there that the enemy gives us is, yeah, but, but he's not really for you because you have this past. Or because you know you're going to fall away in the future. Ah, that sounds like the word of the enemy to me because Romans 8.31 says, God is for me. Who then could possibly be against? I believe that God is with you always no matter what, in every circumstance, constantly, continually, always. When he pulls his followers around to give them the Great Commission, he gives them instruction to, about his will and desire for what he wants his people to accomplish. And not just, okay, you've had your training, now go out and do it. It's not that. Listen to this. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. We're called to believe in the power of prayer. And our prayers matter. Your prayers matter. James chapter 5, verse 16 says this, Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. This is one of those moments that in Scripture where if you and I ever get to the spot where we feel like our prayers are just we're shouting up to the sky, this is a Scripture we're called to remember. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful, is effective, has great power as it moves. If we get to a spot like this, it's worth seeking out somebody else and confessing and admitting it and owning up to it and saying, I, I, I'm not really sure that I feel like much is happening when I pray other than I'm hearing my, my lips move and I don't know about that. The times that I've had people say that to me and the times I've said that to people have been ripe ground, fertile soil for the kind of fruit that the Holy Spirit grows. Because your prayers are powerful and effective. And if we don't believe that about ourselves, let's just believe this about this, because God gives us to us the Holy Spirit, and it is the Lord who is constantly praying through us, for us, in ways that we could never fully understand. It is Jesus Christ. When we pray, we pray in the power of the Holy Spirit through Jesus the Son directly to God the Father. And Jesus is the righteous person. He's the one. And if Jesus is praying for you, then how better could that be? Some of the best things that you and I can do is to say, okay, then, then Lord, let me align my prayer with your prayer for me. Because that right there is powerful. And I can want what I want, but Lord, I want what you want. More and more and more. And then let's, let's believe in the power of connection with others. There's no such thing as doing this Christian walk alone. Thank God. Could you imagine how terrible it would be if God called us to deep faith and said, now, you're on your own good luck. I'll be with you always, but you won't see me or feel me or know that I'm with you all the time. Just, just trust it. Uh, but all those other people, they're going to be against you. How awful would that be? But he calls us to assemble together as the bodies of believers. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 talks about this strength through connection this way. It says, two people are better than one because they will have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. 
faith interlocked with the faith of another that is rooted in Christ Jesus is not easily overcome. Could you imagine if this is what the church became known for? Throughout the world, Christ followers, what they do, when distractions come, when struggle comes, when turmoil comes, they don't panic. They lock in their faith with each other, and they protect each other and anyone else who needs to huddle underneath some sort of a shield that can take down the enemy because the shield is Jesus, and Jesus is our shield. Could you imagine if this is what Christians were known for? Or just, just narrow that down. What about you? What about you? I think through this exercise that we did at the beginning, because the time comes when that account runs dry, and it's empty, and it's gone, and the day comes for all of us when we gather in a large spot to worship, and it's our loved ones who get enter into the room for the purpose of thanking God for the life of the one that they used to walk with and miss and can see no more. And I, I just tell you, as a pastor who gets the honor to walk through the grief process with families and the conducting of a funeral there's hardly any other greater time to hear about people's faith than in that moment. Especially about 10, 15 minutes before you, you've been in the funerals, you've been in this spot where the pastor gathers the immediate family and they pull into a side to a room that we're gonna pray. We're also, we're gonna talk through the order of things. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna walk in, everyone will stand. We'll wait for you to take the front two rows. We're going to read these scriptures. We're going to sing some songs. Who's, who is speaking in the family? One, two, three, okay. Then I'll get up and I'll do my message part. But right now, we're about to head into the room. What needs to be said into this space? What needs to be spoken now? And I just tell you, the powerful Words of witness in that space are greater than any message I could share. It's so much better than the things that get shared later on when we come in the room. Things like, my mother loved me entirely. My grandfather had faith. Imagine the people that you love the most in the world gathering in a room off to the side and they're talking about you and they're about to go thank God for you. But in that side room, that's where they name the things that you are known for. What if, what if it gets said, oh, I got to benefit from this person's faith. I got to connect my faith right up next to theirs. And when I didn't know what it was like to pray, I just had to listen to her. I just had to talk with him. And when I wasn't really sure that I could lean in on faith and really trust, he encouraged me. And she listened to me. to be known as someone whose faith is strong enough to take down the attacks of the enemy. I want to be that someday. Would you then believe and trust God is who he says he is. 
And he loves to do powerful things in the life of people who will place their faith in him. Let's pray. God, how great you are. How great you are. We thank you for the gift of faith. That it's not something that just wells up from within us or, or, or comes up from our, our own thinking or feeling. It's not of our own makeup or devices. But it's this gift that you give to us. And you call us to step into that by believing that your promises are promises that you keep. That you are who you say you are. And that we are who you say that we are. And that there is nothing that changes that. God, for those of us today who are longing for faith like that, would you give us the gift? And give us the gift and, and release us of any pressures it feels like we have to master or subdue this faith that you give us. But instead, God, help us to be freed by faith. And to be focused by faith. And Lord, when distractions come, would you give us brothers and sisters to walk with us? That if the time comes and our shield fails, well, it doesn't really matter. Because it's locked up with other people who stand in the gap. First and foremost, Jesus, that's you. Thank you. Help us then to trust you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. As we continue to worship, we'll close with a song here. Um,